I tell you this this morning we've had all of this rain and gloomy weather and things of that nature and you had some bad football defeats and things like that but I tell you what uh, it takes a lot it's gonna take a lot to get me down because I have had some wonderful things happen uh, this week and uh, <clears throat> not the obvious things that you may come to your mind and think about but God has just been so good and I, I'm just reminded that we got to keep our eyes on him and as the song was saying in the cross is our glory ever. Um, and and you, if you maintain that, it doesn't matter what the winds of the world and things like that to go around, you'll have a joy uh, that lasts uh, throughout it all. Uh, this morning, I want to look at uh, the, the titles that serve the potter and not the clay. Um, <clears throat> and really, in light of the election uh, that happened last week, no matter how that happened, no matter which way it went, uh, this message was going to be applicable. Uh, and if you're looking at the numbers, as I did look at last night to try to make sure I was right, looking at the popular vote, about 48% uh, of the United States, around 70 million people, uh, woke up on two, I mean, excuse me, woke up on Wednesday, or if they were like me, stayed up till Wednesday morning anyway, um, and uh, <clears throat> woke up, and, and they were uh, really uh, perplexed, uh, beaten. And, uh, and not in a good place. The other 50.5 uh, million Americans, 75 million people, uh, probably uh, decided that, whew, you know, felt a sigh of relief, wiped the sweat from their brow, <sighs> sit back, maybe we can have a little bit of time uh, to relax. Maybe they said that the mission uh, wa was complete you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that either one should have felt quite that way, but that's the way some people have felt. I asked in my Sunday school class this morning, um, <clears throat> did you know anybody that took the, you know, uh, the election badly? And I can tell you, folks, that we've got to come to a place. I almost posted uh, a picture. Well, I, excuse me, I say, I'm saying that wrong. I did post uh, a picture uh, of, of the results a screenshot of my TV when it said that Trump had won. I did post that, and then something just within me said, ah, no, no. And within about 10 seconds, I took it down. Uh, and the next morning, I wrote a Facebook post, post uh, that, that I felt good about writing. Um, and, and I think that we need, and in that post, I'm going to tell you something. I believe, this is Corey, it's not in your notes, I believe it is time for this nation to come together, okay? And the only way to do that is for both sides to quit being so tribal, for both sides to quit hating each other, for, for us to realize, you know, I was on the side of the one who won this time. I've not made it any bones about it that that's my personal view, but guess what? I have to be a pastor to everybody. I have to be a chaplain to everybody. And when I went into my business, this week, there were lots of people that were down. And what do I do? Go, ha, 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 you lost, sucker! That's what my Facebook would have looked like had I taken the time just to gloat, 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 gloat. And what do people think about me as a Christian? You know? Um, and, and, and again, I'm happy. I'm perfectly happy. I don't think it's wrong to be happy when you think when Georgia wins, I like it. But guess what? I also don't gloat too, too, too much about that. No one, too. There's plenty of people in here that are not Georgia football, uh, Bulldog fans. I don't want to push Brenda too far, you know. Patsy, too far. You know, they're wrong, but hey, you know. Still come to church, you know, uh, uh, here. And then there's others of you that I didn't point out. Um, but just like we do that with the football, we've got to be careful to understand there are people on the other side. I talked to a, a, a and he has three daughters, and he happens to be African-American. And I said, listen, how was it for your daughters? I said, I'm not supposed to talk about politics partisanly, but I want to ask you as far as your home, how was your home Wednesday morning? And he shared with me that it was pretty tough. It was pretty tough for his daughters. They're young. They were looking at things in the way of, hey, here is this person. And then there was a, it didn't happen. And some people, you know, you, don't, you need to understand there are people that have legitimate feelings. There are some of those feelings. Now, I don't think that the adults that elect, that, that actually were old enough to vote, 
should necessarily feel those types of ways and that, but some people do. But there were lots of little kids, and I made sure in my home I am the father of a daughter. I wanted to make sure that when my daughter understood that the person that was running on the other side was not one that I liked, it wasn't because that person was a female. Because I want my daughter to believe that one day she can be the president of the United States and she won't say, and I will vote for her all day long. If she's qualified, you know, hopefully she'll be. I think she's qualified now because she's fierce, okay? Uh, so we'll see, all right? But, but I, I wanted to make sure I was sensitive to those types of things because there are people that are out there that legitimately have things on the, on the other side. We've got to, we, and, and again, I, I think that I, I felt from some people this jubilation, right? This jubilation that, oh, now, yes, we won. Everything's great. God has shown favor to us. God has blessed the United States now as if he wouldn't have blessed the United States had it went the other way. I, I'm just not sure. I want to challenge us a little bit uh, in, in these times. The only way that a person could feel that the mission is complete and it's time to sit back and relax is if you uh, think that the mission, the, the mission in quotations, is centered on politics. God and let me bust some bubbles here this morning. God doesn't care about Democrats or Democrats or Republicans, independents of the Green Party. He does not care. Hey, come on, argue with me. I'm ready. Go back to 1 Samuel. When they said they wanted a king, Samuel got a little upset. He was a little perplexed about it, as the Bible says. And, and God says, no, 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 no. It's okay, Samuel. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And whether you call it a king or you call it a prime minister or you call it a president, it's the same thing. We are putting our efforts into somebody that's not God and he doesn't like it. You want to know proof of that even more than I just gave you? Whenever the true kingdom of God comes, there ain't going to be an election. Jesus Christ is going to reign with an iron scepter for a thousand years in the millennial kingdom. And then when that's over with, then you all, the only one sitting on the throne is God the Father. Amen. He's not interested in democracy. He's interested in a theocracy. And that is what is, that's what it's all about. Yes, there are times this person can help and all of those kinds of things that happen. But I want you, if you've been so sucked up into all of this stuff happening in the world, I think you need to pay close attention to Colossians 3, 2. I mean, read it. I don't, I don't really like tattoos myself, but I'll, I'll be okay if you tattoo this on your forehead. Set your minds on things above. Amen. Not. You see that word? Circle it, underline it, bold it. Not on earthly things. That, is, that didn't say you can't pay attention to it. That doesn't say you can't look over here at it, that you can't be a little interested in it, but you cannot set your mind on those things. Fixate on it, okay? Laser-like focus that that's the thing. Set your minds on things above, not on the things of this, of this earth. And I want to make this point, and I'm going to read exactly what I wrote because I think it was good. The results of the election did not change our mission. It didn't change our mission one bit. What is different in the mission of Christians from Monday to Wednesday? Not a thing. Not a thing. Our focus should still be on spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost and dying world at every opportunity the potter God gives us. The election didn't mean that if she had won, it wouldn't have meant that we were going to work any harder than we already needed to work. And because he won, doesn't mean we have any less work to be done. Our work is the same. We're out there, this world, Donald Trump getting elected did not somehow <coughs> bring salvation to this country. Nor is he a savior. And guess what? Read my Facebook post if you hadn't. To, hum, to whom much is given, much is required. Now, I think God has given us some grace. We'll see. We'll see. The jury's out on whether we're going to do what we need to do. But I think it starts with us. It's, it's always been with us, and it starts with us in the church. And hopefully you'll get there with me as we go through this. In Psalm 146, 3 through 7, uh, I, want, I have 
I have used these verses many times over the past many months, uh, but I want to read this passage. It says, do, you see that word? We got to, if you're in school before and they have a not question, you sometimes want to circle that so you make sure that you understand you're answering the question about what is not and what is. It says, do not put your trust in princes, in human beings. Why? Because they cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground on the very day their plans come to nothing. And on that very day, their plans come to nothing. Hold on, go, go back to verse 4. What's that saying? Huh? They die. Human beings come and go. Human beings are here one day, gone the next. And guess what? When that one's gone, guess what? All the plans they had are gone with them. All right. Uh, there may be somebody else going to pick it up, and that person's going to die, and it's going to be the same thing. In verse 5, uh, he, he goes on uh, to say, Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. Who remains faithful forever? Who remains faithful forever, Mary Beth? God. Not any single person, not your spouse, not this pastor, not anybody in this church, not your job, not your kids, your family, your parents, none of those things. God is the only one that remains faithful the entire time. Look, and, and go, oh boy, verse 7 is something else here. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. All those campaign promises from all those politicians that are, you know, vote for me and I'll help you. You know, vote, vote for me and I'll give you money, help the oppressed, and we're going to raise up the poor and we're going to do all of those things and we're going to set prisoners free. We're going to have some criminal justice reform and we're going to get people out of, out of here and all of these things here. Who is this verse saying does that? God. God is the one that's behind helping us, helping us really. <clears throat> now, I, I put this in your notes. Human leaders may very well help facilitate God's plan. But we got to be careful not to elevate them to the place of being the author and the source of all of those things that are good. Because you're going to get failed. That's why most people, they put all of their hope in politicians. And if we could only get that one person elected, I'm like, oh my gosh. I mean, it's, it, that, that's just nuts because uh, you, can get that, you can get that person with the right letter behind their name, a D or an R, behind their name up there. But if that person squanders an opportunity to honor God, then God is not going to bless. It is not, God doesn't have, he does not have to use us. But he does choose to use us as instruments of his will. And, and guess what? People can, as you may have in your own life, have you wasted opportunities in your life? Has God set you up and placed you in places and given you grace and mercy and said, here you go. He laid it all out for you. And here's your opportunity, whatever it is you can think of. And you messed it up. Are, aren't we able to mess up? You know, not the grand plan. <laughs> that is not going to happen. But we can mess up things within our own lives. So guess what? Politicians can mess up things that they have been, they have been given. You've got to trust in God. Because guess what? As long as you're trusting in God and you're trusting in his plan, when that politician fails, you're okay. Because God's got somebody else that's going to come in there because his ultimate plan is going to happen. It's why you, that's why it says he is the one for the oppressed. He's the one that's going to set prisoners free. All of that. Look at Acts 4.12. And man, you've got to get this. <coughs> Salvation is found in what? No one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Who is that name? Jesus. I was talking about Jesus. I watched the Republican National Convention, and I was a little nervous at some points within that Republican Convention because, whoo it seemed like, you know, you get the preachers up there and all, and they seem to go a little too far to me in, in almost deifying people. Uh, and and I, I was a little worried that sometimes we were elevating President Trump a little too high. Maybe you bought the Bible or something like that, you know, and you, you know, $150 or whatever like that. And, and, and they were just putting a little too much emphasis. And, and although I'm okay with people being you know, passionate and all of that stuff, we got to be careful not to think that, again, as I said earlier, 
that Donald Trump is a savior. Because he's not. And I wouldn't have had to preach about Kamala Harris. We know that was not going to be the Savior, but it wouldn't have been him. not going to be J.D. Vance in the future or anybody else that is out there like that. They're just tools that God will use. And guess what? He can use the Democrat too. You know when Paul was writing in, the, in Romans about all this stuff about submitting to governing authorities, do you know who was sitting on the throne of Rome? Huh? Yeah, that's a good answer there, Billy. Caesar, it was Emperor Nero. Pretty awful fella. Very awful guy. Horrible. Worse than any Democrat we've ever seen. Worse than any Republican we've ever seen or independent that we've ever seen. But God used him. God used Pharaoh. Did he not use Pharaoh uh, in, in, in the time of Moses? Horrible guy. God uses these people. That's why when Romans tells us that, that we don't have any leader that God has not appointed, that God has not said that it's okay for that person to be there. And, and so in Jeremiah 18, verses 1 through 10, you really, you really got to latch on, latch on to this title. Uh, and what God is talking to Jeremiah in his context is applicable to us in our uh, context. He says, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into a, another pot, shaping it as, as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, and if that nation, I warn, repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I have planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. Yikes. Now I want you to, be un I want you to understand. This was in a context of the nation of Israel and, 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 and the nation of Judah. Uh, God is about to deliver some pretty difficult things uh, uh, by, by way of, of Jeremiah to the nation of, of Judah. He's talking to them and talking about Israel uh, right now, but they have the divided uh, kingdom. And, and Jeremiah is the prophet. He's the one that's delivering these messages to God. But these things that, that God is saying right here are applicable to us in our time. Notice in verse 4 that the, the potter he was making, and, and God, God loves to use these object lessons. Jesus taught this way. God has done it throughout the entire Bible. He says, hey, he knew that Jeremiah was limited even though he was a prophet. He said, Jeremiah, I won't tell you something, but I want you to go down there to the potter's house before I tell this to you so that Jeremiah could see what God was doing. So Jeremiah goes to the potter's house. He's watching the potter with the, the wheel there forming the pot and it got messed up. And the potter fixed it. He said, well, I can't do the pot I was going to do. So he made another one according to how it seemed best to the potter. And then once Jeremiah saw that, it's, it's, it tells us that then the word of the Lord came to me in verse 5. And God said, can I do that same thing? Just like that potter, he formed that clay how he wanted to. You are clay in my hand, and can I form you? the way that I want to. And look at again specifically what he's talking about. God tells him right there, and this is going to be the message, in verse 7, if at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed. So God's, God is the one that can tear a nation down, right? He can declare it to be uprooted. He can declare it to be destroyed. He can also, as it says later, he can say that a nation to be planted, a nation to be ri rise up for it to form, for that nation to prosper. He gets to declare how those things go. So the question I put in your notes, what was required of the people? We know that God can make them rise or fall, but what's the responsibility of the people that make up the nations? Huh? 
Okay, so he, so he says, he says in verse 8, And if that nation I warned, what? Repents of its evil. Then what happens? God reconsiders. We say that God doesn't change his mind, that he's immutable. He doesn't change. Oh, many times he's changed, changed his mind because what he did was make a conditional statement. This is going to happen, but he leaves it open that if you, if you learn the lesson, then he won't destroy you know, the, the, the place or, or whatever. And this is what he's saying. I'll declare this is going to happen, but I'm going to then put the ball in your court. So if you think about our nation right now, <coughs> where's the ball? I mean, not 100%, but he's given the ball to us. Right now, we're playing. And he'll see how it goes. He'll, 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 let, us, he'll let us play the ball for a little while. Sometimes he has to step in because we just, like I wish he would have done at the game last night, you know. But... <laughs> Sometimes he'll step in and say, okay, okay, okay. I mean, I, I can't even take this. Like, this is ridiculous. You know, and he'll, he'll change out a couple of people. He, he does do that. But for the most part, he puts the ball in our court. And he says, and what, what we have to do, and, and it is the United States. Let me ask you this. Is the United States, as it sits right now, a righteous nation? You mean to tell me that 75 million people voted for a Republican, and, and so you will say that a majority of people have voted for a Republican, right? Right? So I'm saying majority, so let's not say the whole nation. 50.5% of the nation voted for Donald Trump, popular vote. Let me ask it this way. Is 50.5% of the United States righteous? No. Sit down, shut up. What? <laughs> I thought that that was the criterion. Oh, no, 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 no. See, y'all talk out of both sides of your mouth. Y'all tell me that every one of those Democrats, and I don't mean all of y'all, but every one of them Democrats, they're horrible people. But all the Republicans, that, the, nobody said this necessarily, but it's almost saying, well, oh, all them Republican people, they must be perfect. Psst. What place you been living in? What percentage of this nation do you think is righteous? I heard 15%, I've heard 10%. What'd you say, Amanda? Five to 10. Two, 25. Oh, look at it. We have an optimist. We, we, have, we have an optimist. Um, what? One dog. Huh? Man. What'd y'all say? Two. Two percent. You know, I don't, I don't. I don't know. I would, to get above 10 makes me wonder. You know, it's really, really hard to get above 10. I can't go with Brenda to 25. But she may be right. I don't know. Boy, 1 and 2 percent is bleak, isn't it? Who, who knows? And that's just, my, that's just my, my, my thinking. Now, when you're looking at things, oh, Mary Beth, look at her. Y'all take notes. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, and it's a cold one, too. Thank you, Mary Beth. I appreciate that because I... She is one of the one percent. You're right about that. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, looking, looking, looking at this, when God is looking at our country, and I'm not sure, y'all, I, <clears throat> I really do. I, let me say it this way. I, I don't know. This is, don't, don't take this as the gospel, because what I'm about to say is, is like that time Paul said, is, is Paul speaking here? This is Corey. I had surrendered that no matter how this election went, if it went the way I didn't think it should go, <clears throat> that was okay, just like the Georgia football game. We're getting what we deserve. Because this nation has turned its back on God, and why would he do anything? We don't deserve that God would bless us. We don't deserve that God would give us grace and mercy. We don't deserve any of that. So we would get what we deserve, and I said, okay, God, it's not going to change my mission. It's not going to change what I've got to do. So it's just going to be harder, and the Bible tells us that there's going to be some bad times that happen. So we've got to deal with that. And I had surrendered that that was going to happen. Because, I, because my feeling was, 
this country couldn't come back from where we were. I'm not convinced yet that we can come back from where we are. But I think that there may be, I do have a little glimmer of hope that on certain things within this election that, that, that give me some hope that we are going to come back to a little bit of common sense. A little bit of, we were being pushed so far in some of the most ultra leftist types of thinking that even people in the left were like, oh, okay, enough. This is, this, this is craziness. This is craziness. Things that totally go against any kind of biblical principles that were there. And that would be bad. I don't know, though, y'all, and all of me saying that I think that the country was bad off. I'm not sure that God has made a decree that this country is going to be uprooted and destroyed. I mean, I'm not saying that he's, I'm not a prophet. He didn't tell me that. But I do know the way we were going. We deserved to be uprooted and destroyed. All right. So what I'm saying is maybe he's made that proclamation. Maybe he has said that the United States is doomed or whatever. I think probably that there's just an unsaid thing that we have acted in ways. And the Bible tells us if you act this way, this is what you get. Okay. And I believe the United States has been acting this way. And we are on a path to get what we're supposed to be getting. But maybe, maybe, just maybe, as happened at a time in our past, like when Billy Graham was running all over around this country, there was a great revival in the United States. Maybe God has for us to tarry a little bit longer. Maybe if we would do what the scriptures tell us right here, and if we would repent from our evil, the stuff that we have been, I thought the country was bad off a long time ago. Man, this whole idea that what we've been doing about the, the gender fluidity kind of thing and trans stuff and you top a couple of that with all of these very fringe beliefs that only maybe two to three to five at the most percent of any population you can get really champion that stuff. It's been the issues of the day. And I don't mind, that could be, an, it'll always be an issue, but how did it get to be the issues? And we just seem to take everything that would spit in the face of God and we make it the biggest front and center thing we can do. And he is not going to put up with that. And so we have some evil in this country. But guess what? It's not just the elites. There's evil hearts right here. Every one of us that's saved, there are times we let that little evil stuff begin to slip out. And we don't act the way that we should do. It starts with every single person in this nation. All 340, however many million people it is of us, to get the evil out of our individual lives. And then collectively when we come together, it'll start to look right. But if you sit here and keep saying, oh, it's them over there. It's those people in that house over there. They got the problem. We're not looking at ourselves. The rot is still here. You ever had a thing of strawberries? And when that one starts to rot, or any kind of fruit like that, it begins to spread throughout the other ones? If you keep, if you, sometimes maybe you're the rot. Sometimes it may be people that look like they're folks in the church or whatever. But it's the people in this nation that, where the ball is in our court right now. And, and I believe that this, you know, I, I, put, I put in your notes that just because America has a new president doesn't mean that, that we have our spiritual lives that are cured. And I'll be honest with you, I don't trust Donald Trump to be the spiritual leader of our country. I don't trust Kamala Harris. I, I don't trust, I, I barely trust Franklin Graham, and I love him. I, there's not many people that I would, that I would trust uh, up there to be the spiritual leader. I'm not, I'm not looking for that politician to be that spiritual awakening person. That's our job. We're not supposed to see. It is the job of the church to put out uh, uh, here at the righteousness of God. And I put in, the, um, in your notes at the bottom, I will say this. I believe that the nation, not about Democrats or Republicans, I believe that the nation looked at some of these very crazy things we were doing. And they said, though, we have rejected that those things 
are the biggest issues. And the nation has kind of come together a little bit and said, all right, let's get to the meat and potatoes of things and we'll deal with those fringe things later. But I think we've come together a little bit and God's given us grace and he's given us mercy right now. And it's what are we gonna do with it? And I think, you know, Donald Trump's saying was make America great again. America, in my view, has never ceased to be great. If, you look, if you're stacking us up against other people in the world, we have remained the greatest nation on the, on the planet as compared to others. Now, that may be fighting for the bottom, but look at what did I put at the end of your notes. What should be the slogan? Make America righteous again. If we can do that, what God will do is he'll say, you know what, I had this particular plan. All of us that look at end times prophecy, we say, well, there is no country in the, United, uh, in the Bible that you can see in the, in the end times and all that. We know we're so close, America must be within a decade of falling off the planet. We don't know that. We don't know that. I can tell you right now, you know, one of the things, the reason I think things happen the way that they did, Israel needs a really strong ally right now. And God uses the United States in a major way for that. Now, the day you see us break our relationship over there and start going the other way, run for the hills. Okay, run for the hills. But, but, no, but nobody has is, is, is shied away from that just yet. But folks, here's where your focus should be. Yeah, drill, baby, drill. That'll be great. Yeah, your stock market and all that stuff and the economy and immigration and all of those things. They'll deal with that, and they can deal with that. But let's not, let's not get off our mission. Our mission to do and to look at as individuals the righteousness of this nation. And if we can take, if we can take the next 18 months, the next 24 months, and the church be really serious. I mean, the church all over this nation be really serious about standing up for the word of God and assist our governing leaders to take this nation to, to maybe repent a little bit of our evil. Maybe, just maybe, God will relent a little bit from the destruction that he was going to place upon this nation. That's our only hope. Our only hope. Donald Trump isn't going to do it from the White House. The people are going to do it from the ground. We should always have been doing it. We always have been trying to get out here to do it. But as in your individual lives, righteousness. What does that mean? I can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't shut up until I make sure you understand what righteousness means. Somebody tell me the definition of righteousness. Right standing, what did you say? Right standing with God. So what does that mean? You cannot be full of sin and be righteous. You cannot be evil and be righteous. You need Jesus Christ to transform your heart and transform your life. I talked to two youth who have a really good plan. I won't name them right this minute. Two youth that had a really good plan. They come up to me Wednesday night, and I love what they're, what they're looking to do. It's, it's very inspiring. We'll talk about it in detail later. But they're looking, they're looking into next year, and, and these, these two kids are trying to plan some things out to get, get students involved in stuff and, and want to make sure that people are saved and all that. And I looked at them both Wednesday, and I said, listen, great plan, great things. We'll talk about it more. Let's see how we can do, and we'll support you all the way. But I said, I want to make sure you both are saved. Really. Don't toy with junk. Don't say because my mom and daddy, my grandpa, I've been coming to church all this time. I stood in a room of 355 chaplains at the, at the 1st of October, and there was chaplains and they wasn't saved. Got saved at the conference. So don't talk to me about it. <laughs> you automatically got a ticket somehow. But I said, before, I said, when you step out and you start getting out here and getting real serious and, and you start jumping out in there against Satan, woo, you better come with the armor and the most important piece is the helmet. I'm asking you, seriously, I talk about going out there all the time. Are you saved? Are you righteous? Do you know Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Are you acting like that? If you don't, if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you're not saved, if you don't know that if you died today that you would go to heaven, do not leave this church before you get with me or somebody and say, hey, 
I, I, I don't think I have been. I've been putting my hope and trust in other things. And I want to be saved. If you know people in your family, that's the most important question we need to be asking people. Are you born again? Are you saved? Has the Holy Spirit really renewed you? We got a lot of fake Christians walking around this place. And I mean this place, talking about this nation. A lot of them. You waiting for the president to pass a law to tell them they have to change? You waiting for them to say, now I identify? We've been, we've been doing this gender thing for a long time. It's, I identify as a Christian, but they ain't. So, that's the thing. Let's talk to people. Let's minister to people. The mission's the same. And let's work to make America righteous again. And then we'll have a marvelous place to be living in. I don't know how long it'll last, but I'd love to be able to say at least one day I lived in America. Some of y'all remember a day the nation was more righteous than it is today. And it was a lot better than what we find ourselves in today. Let's work for it because it's our job. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you will help us, God. And we're going to take communion here in just a moment. But Lord, you have given us all the tools necessary. Lord, you've given us personal tools. You've given us tools within this, this church, God, to be about your business. Uh, Father, and, and the, the whims of politics have not, not really changed anything, Father, uh, than what we, are, we were already needing to do. That may be in some respects a little bit easier. But Father, I pray that you would not allow there to be a spirit of laxity that you will not allow us to sit back and think there's any time to waste, uh, Lord, that somehow we've won a battle or we've not won anything yet. And Father, the battle of the soul of this nation is still very much at play. And Satan is doing everything he can, uh, Lord, to, to batter this nation because it has been a beacon for you across this entire world. And Lord, I pray that, that we can have that restored. We pray, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. We pray for your relenting. Uh, Lord, on us. But Father, we know that that comes with the condition that we must repent. And I pray for anyone that's here today, if they have not repented of their sins, if they have not come into a place of righteousness by, by being reborn through the Holy Spirit and through Jesus Christ, Lord, that they would do that today. And that, Lord, that we would be able to minister to this lost and dying world. And Lord, as we, as we take communion here in just a little bit, Father, I pray that if there's anything that people have brought into this place today that is hindering our communion, our fellowship with you, that we would surrender it right now. Give it to you so that, Lord, that we can take communion in a holy and a righteous position. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.